Hi there and welcome to our Facebook Live, Who Cares About the Rules of War Anyway? I'm Gemma Snowden, I work here at New Zealand Red Cross. I've got a very special guest here with me today, Peter Mora, who's the President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you for joining us. Thanks now, for having me. No worries. Um, now the Rules of War, or International Humanitarian Law, they set out what can and can't be done during armed conflict. Um, so they set out sort of limits to war, offer protection to civilians, and also parameters as to what is and isn't acceptable during armed conflict. So today we're going to dig a bit more into that um, and find out whether states actually follow these rules um, and what the point of them is and who cares about them. So Peter, let's just start with the basics. Can you tell us what those limits and protections that the rules of war are in a nutshell and why we should care about them? Well, there are two or three elements which are absolutely crucial in uh, today's world uh, uh, on the rules of war. Uh, let me just uh, familiarize you with three important principles in the, what we call the conduct of hostilities. When armies and armed forces and non-state armed actors are engaged into operations of war, they have uh, in any circumstances to respect three principles. The principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution. Distinction means that at all times they have to make a difference between militaries and civilians, between military objectives and civilian objectives. And when they attack the adversary, they have to take precautionary measures. Precaution is the second important uh, principle. They have to distinguish between with the militaries and civilians, and they have to take care that the civilians are, uh, are not harmed. So distinction, precaution, and then proportionality is the third principle, which is of critical importance. When your adversary attacks you, uh, your response must be proportional. Uh, it has, you can just, uh, when somebody shoots at, at you with a gun, uh, then retaliate with a 10 days uh, operation in which you bomb uh, a, a whole village or a whole city. So these principles are absolutely uh, critical. And the second set of principles is uh, with regard to, uh, to those detained uh, in the context uh, of hostilities. You have to treat detainees with humanity, and this is exemplified uh, in other circumstances, in, that, in other provisions of international humanitarian law. So the conduct of hostilities, which uh, is at the basis of the protection of civilians, is the big uh, first chapter of uh, international humanitarian law, the treatment uh, of those who are captured is the second uh, most relevant issue with which we are dealing. Then international humanitarian law has other elements which are equally important. You are not supposed to use illegal weapons uh, in conflict, and illegal weapons are weapons which are indiscriminately used in conflict, which do not make the difference intrinsically between uh, civilians and, uh, uh, and militaries. Right, I can see that quite a few people have um, logged on to watch this, so if anyone's watching at home um, and would like to send in some questions, then just do so by writing in the comments and uh, we'll put those to Peter today. So can you tell us um, who these rules apply to? Is it just during international armed conflicts or is it um, kind of any civil disturbance or unrest? International humanitarian law is uh, basically designed to regulate uh, uh, armed conflict uh, in international armed conflict as well as non-international uh, armed conflict. And ICRC as an organization has a mandate to support states who have defined those rules in the implementation of those rules. But those rules are not applicable only to states, they are applicable to parties to conflict. And one of the realities of today's world is that not only states are engaged in conflict, non-state armed groups are also 
uh, members and our participants in conflict, and therefore the rules of war, international humanitarian law, is applicable to states as well as to non-state armed groups, uh, at least uh, to a certain extent, in international as well as in non-international armed conflict. Now, uh, to be honest, not all the rules are uh, in the same way applicable in international armed conflict uh, in internal armed conflict. So there are differentiations, but the scope overall of international humanitarian law is covering what I just mentioned. Mm. And you also kind of touched on the mandate of uh, Red Cross just then. So can you explain a bit about um, what role Red Cross plays in uh, conflict and making sure that uh, people apply international humanitarian law? Indeed, our mandate is really to engage with parties to the conflict so that they respect international humanitarian law. What does this mean concretely? It means that in time of peace, we train armed forces and uh, in the basics of international humanitarian law. We ensure that the conduct of hostilities is trained uh, in armed forces according to international humanitarian law. In cases of conflict, we try to engage on a day-to-day -day basis with armed forces and with non-state armed groups in the context in which we operate and to remind them when we uh, recognize through their activities on the ground that they are violating international humanitarian law, we engage with them operationally and we ask them uh, to design their military operation in another way than the way which violates international humanitarian law. So we engage operationally with actors on the ground. So in the present day, just to give you uh, an idea, uh, ICRC entertains with more than 120 armed forces in the world, state armies in the world, training activity. And we have engagements with more than 200 non-state armed groups in the context in which we operate today in order to convince them and to engage them in the respect of international international humanitarian law. Is it difficult to engage with those groups, particularly the non-state actors who, I mean, they never signed on to the wars in the first place? Well, in, interestingly enough, uh, while indeed they haven't signed up to international humanitarian law, but many of the non-state armed groups are very much aware that uh, international humanitarian law is applicable to them. And I'm sometimes surprised when I talk myself to members of non-state armed groups that they are very uh, literate in the Geneva Conventions, uh, the basic documents of international humanitarian law. So it's not really knowledge which is the critical issue. It's more the translation of knowledge into behavior which is uh, of, critical, of critical importance. Talking to non-state armed groups, engaging with state and non-state armed group is not always easy. Because while ICRC is ready to talk to everybody who is engaged in war, everybody who is engaged in war is not necessarily interested in talking to ICRC. <laughs> and so we have an asymmetrical relationship and uh, we have to recognize that there are parts of the world where either armed forces or non-state armed groups are unwilling to talk to the ICRC, to learn about the rules of law, uh, of war, and this is are most of the cases where this, uh, these laws are violated and the civilian population still very often takes uh, and carries the brunt uh, of the negative impact of the tax. And we actually have a question from one of our followers. Um, Ellie, can you read that out? I've actually got two questions here, so I'll ask them both and then hopefully we can get answers to both. The first uh, is when you've got an era of conflict where the battle lines are so blurred, how do we apply IHL to situations like Yemen or Syria where local parties are influenced by larger powers? Uh, and the second one is New Zealand is a peaceful, geographically remote country that doesn't see the impact of conflict directly. Why should New Zealanders care about IHL? On the first question, let me just say that indeed this is one of the big challenges with which we are confronted today because uh, actors are so uh, multiple in, the, uh, in today's 
battlefields. You have uh, uh, so numerous uh, actors that uh, sometimes roles and responsibilities are blurry. Uh, ICRC strategy is very much to talk to everybody who has direct or indirect influence on the behavior on the ground. And that's the reason why in a context like Yemen, which was just mentioned, our engagement goes far beyond the parties on the ground in Yemen. We also talk to those influencing the parties on the ground, neighboring countries. We talk to the alliance, uh, which is at, uh, at war with uh, the Yemeni opposition. We talk to uh, parties to the uh, parties further away. So we use a broad definition of influence, role, and responsibility in order to engage on a broad scale, uh, and we do quite comprehensive mapping, which allows us also to talk to many actors on the ground. The second challenge which speaks to the blurring is that sometimes the diff difference between war and peace is not so clear anymore today. And in that sense, it's not always very clear whether international humanitarian law is applicable or whether human rights law and other bodies of law are applicable in a certain context. Uh, today, war, criminality, terrorism, intercommunal violence, and civil unrest, they are all concepts which flow into each other and which uh, leads us in a situation where international humanitarian law is one of the legal system applicable and you can easily find yourself in a situation where three or four overlapping legal systems are applicable in a certain context. Why should New Zealand, um, as a peaceful country, care about? I think you should care about international humanitarian law because at the end of the day, when international humanitarian law is not respected, we know that conflicts are in an even worse shape than uh, you could imagine and they have even bigger impact on civilian populations. We know it today. Uh, we are in a world living with record numbers of displaced populations. Almost 70 million people in the world are displaced by war and violence. Most of them are displaced not because war is taking place, because most of them are displaced because uh, international humanitarian law in these wars is violated. And I think we need all responsible members of the international community to care about these norms and values and principles in warfare, because whoever has an influence and can do even a small step towards the respect and the applicability of those normative systems can have an influence and in, in, into respect of international humanitarian law. The problems created by violations will affect New Zealand, affect the Asia Pacific, as we know. You have seen how many refugees from faraway places come to the Asia Pacific. And most of the time, irregular migration movements, irregular movements of refugees are the direct result of violations of international humanitarian law. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think a lot of the time Kiwis can feel quite helpless um, to do anything about the problems that they see in the world due to the geographic isolation down here. So what would you recommend people do if they want to make sure that, you know, states do adhere to the norms? How can they advocate that uh, the rules of war are followed? Well, there are multiple engagements. I mean, first and foremost, let me appreciate New Zealand is not only a far away place. Uh, it has substantive international engagement. It has peacekeepers. It has uh, uh, their military. Uh, uh, militaries are active also in the international arena to help to, uh, in, in international effort. And this is very much appreciated. And, and in that sense, there is always abilities either to support humanitarian actors on the ground, to support uh, the Red Cross and the Crescent Movement, to support non-state, uh, non, uh, 
to, to support NGOs, non-governmental organizations who do humanitarian work. So uh, there are a lot of organizations engaging. You have an, uh, you have a, a New Zealand the National Commission for International Humanitarian Law, which is an important place where the challenges of international humanitarian law are thought through and where you can intellectually contribute to the further development of the law, to the thinking about the law. And uh, I think increasingly also with uh, the digital environment, there are platforms worldwide, global, in which you can easily tap from, uh, from your comfortable home in New Zealand into being an intellectual thought leader on the future of international humanitarian law. So there are multiple engagements from concrete engagements for the law on the ground that you can do uh, financial, practical, uh, you can travel uh, in the context of the operations of uh, organizations who deal with international humanitarian law for the respect of this law. You can do a lot of things uh, depending on your interest. Excellent, and thanks very much for the people who sent in the questions. Um, don't forget that you can comment if you have any more to ask Peter. And so what actually happens to states if they do break the or any party to a conflict, if they do break the rules? Well, it's one of the big challenges that international law in general uh, is a legal system which has a uh, little compliance mechanism, mechanisms. Uh, that's the characteristics of a state-based uh, international system where states have been reluctant to create supranational bodies responsible for their for the behaviors of states. So the responsibility is the first responsibility for the respect of international humanitarian law is with states. And at the same time, we have to recognize that the international humanitarian law doesn't have a mechanism comparable to criminal law in internal justice which would easily allow to induce state responsibility. We all know there is the International Criminal Court, which is adjudicating violations, serious violations of international humanitarian law. Uh, but uh, to bring a case in front of the International Criminal Court is a big challenge. It is not happening each and every day. So, when I come back to my own organization, ICRC has been mentioned in the Geneva Convention as an organization helping states to implement international humanitarian law. So rather than a enforcement mechanism, this body of law has a more consultative and more uh, consensus built mechanisms like the International Committee of the Red Cross who which through its engagement with states tries to nudge them into behavior rather than adjudicate violations of international humanitarian law. Right, I think we've got a, another question. Yeah, we've got two more questions coming in from our audience online. So the first question is, apart from in Australia and New Zealand, what does ICRC do in the Pacific? And secondly, what about um, how will Red Cross or the ICRC be involved in developing new international laws for near future weapons or new technologies? Um, and do you feel that current humanitarian law will be relevant in the battlefields of the near future? In the uh, Asia Pacific, uh, we have uh, quite interesting operational activities, uh, in particular in PNG. Uh, where ICRC is uh, active in the more ethnic-driven uh, violence in the mountainous region of PNG. We are uh, visiting detainees in, uh, uh, in Nauru and Manus uh, for the last couple of years, and so we are working on the offshore centers uh, operationally. We are engaging with many of the countries uh, in the Asia Pacific in order to ensure appropriate training for international humanitarian law. So we are engaging with the armed forces in the region uh, uh, in, a, in a quite comprehensive way. Uh, in 
Southeast Asia, we have very big operations of ICRC, as you may know, the, in Myanmar, uh, in uh, Bangladesh, in the Philippines, we have uh, big operational activities. So uh, a lot of operational legal training activities uh, are taking place uh, in this region as well. But it is true that when you look at ICRC's budget, uh, over the last couple of years, and so if you look at budget and human resources, the focus has been on violent conflicts in the Middle East and Africa. That's where the big impact of war on populations has taken place. And therefore, the work in the Asia-Pacific, besides the more operational activities that I have mentioned, is very much a work more on the prevention of uh, violations of international humanitarian law side, more on the training and educational side than on the operational uh, side. Uh, with regard to new weapons technology, it is another task of ICRC, which is mentioned in the Geneva Conventions, that uh, ICRC is invited to engage with states with regard to new technology, technological developments and with regard to the relevance of new technological developments and new weapons uh, with regard to international humanitarian law. Therefore, we are very much concerned and we are putting a lot of time and energy and resources into evaluating whether new technological developments, in particular weapons technology development, uh, whether these developments are in either compatible or not compatible with the basic provisions of international humanitarian law. And this brings us to think today uh, very proactively on how, for instance, the future wars in cyberspace are, uh, how international humanitarian law applies to the virtual cyberspace. It brings us to think about uh, autonomous weapons and what exactly autonomous weapons are and how exactly autonomous weapons are uh, could be used or are being used already uh, in conflict theaters and whether this allows or, or these weapons allow for the respect of international humanitarian law according to the three principles that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, distinction, proportionality and precaution. So ICRC entertains a lot of legal thinking and engages with states in order to harmonize legal thinking around new weapons technologies. And uh, if we come to the conclusion that the international community is ready to move forward on these issues, we also launch more formal processes with, our, with regard to framing uh, legal thinking around new weapons, uh, new weapons technology. I do believe that international humanitarian law is relevant uh, in today's world. It's, we use it each and every day and we are in almost all the conflicts of the world and therefore it is highly relevant. There, I know that many people think that the law is always violated. That's true that it is repeatedly violated, but it is also respected and we should not forget that our work and the work of many others for the respect of international humanitarian law is happening because this law is seen as being relevant, as being important. And I think it's important to recognize that this legal body goes far beyond the legal text. It has been law which has been with mankind for hundreds of years, which emerges from the customs of societies and from customary international law and it has been relevant in the past and it will be relevant in the future, which does not mean that the future will not see new bodies of law, new legislation coming forward by the consensus of states. Okay, uh, we have about five minutes left and a couple more questions to get through. So just quickly, um, you have visited um, some very high conflict areas even just this year, including Syria, um, which is a country in its eighth year of war now. Can you explain um, how 
violations of international humanitarian law have affected the people that you've met? Well, most of the violations that you see today is really uh, happens by indiscriminate use of force by the one side or the other side uh, in a context of war. And indiscriminate use of force happens very often in urban areas. Syria has been the emblematic case and you have seen all the, this, the, the, the pictures of destructions in cities like Aleppo or Homs, uh, which show how the use of force, the indiscriminate bombardments, uh, artillery is being thrown into uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, of civilian populations, how this leads to physical destruction, it leads to displacements, it leads to psychosocial trauma, uh, for generations of populations. Uh, if you look only at the case of Syria, it's distressing to see that half of the population has been displaced by the war. Imagine that is a population of 22, 23 million people and 11 to 12 million people have been displaced. In Yemen, for instance, uh, a country which has been poor before, but today more than two-thirds, uh, almost uh, three-quarters three of the population is dependent on humanitarian assistance. These are direct impacts of violations of international humanitarian law, the lives and livelihoods of people by the destructive force of weapons and war and by the disrespect of international humanitarian law are uprooted in their lives and livelihoods and deeply affected and the worst is maybe still to come in the sense that not only people are affected directly by the war, but uh, children, youth are affected uh, for, and maybe for generations are affected by the war here today. So uh, it is a very serious situation to which the violation of international humanitarian law brings us today. Well, I mean, in light of these conflicts that you're talking about and these continued breaches of the rules of war, do you think that respect for international humanitarian law is decreasing? Well, to be very frank, we have no baseline. We don't know, and there has probably not been a golden period where the law has been respected, which we could take as a baseline and then uh, have a clear indicator whether there is degradation or not. What I can say is that in the 15 conflicts of the world which are the most violent and which we, in which we see daily violations of international humanitarian law, we see massive impact of the violations of these laws. Just to remind you, those 15, 20 largest conflicts in the world today are responsible for 80% of the displacements that we are, uh, we, we are witnessing. So unquestionably there is massive violations and massive, uh, of, uh, massive violations of international humanitarian law. At the same time, uh, I'm not a doomsayer. We also know that there are those civilians not at there are those hospitals not attacked. There are those neighborhoods which uh, withstand the destructive force of war. So there is respect for international humanitarian law and there are those belligerents who care about the way war is waged today. And I think it is important to highlight, uh, we just have published a study on the roots of war. You can find them on ICRC's webpage uh, and you can have a look at it because it, it highlights the importance and it highlights the fact that international humanitarian law is respected and there is our rules of restraint that belligerents apply, with, uh, uh, apply and which lead to the fact that international humanitarian law is respected. So the big challenge today is to minimize the violations and to maximize the respect. So both of them are a reality, but we have to work that uh, violations stop and that uh, respect gets more space. Thank you, Demora.
President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and if you did still have a question about international humanitarian law um, and didn't have a chance to ask it, then you can leave a comment on our Facebook page or send us a tweet. Our handle is at NZ Red Cross, and uh, we'll get our international humanitarian law advisor to answer that for you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.